the marinade. There's no O in marinade. Let's try it one more time. Ready? One, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> the marinade. <laughs> marrow. Marrow. Marinade. Marrow. Bone marinade. The marinade. The marinade. With Jason Earl. Welcome to the Marinade with Jason Earl, a free-flowing conversation about the creative process with creative people. This is episode 48, and our guest is Caleb Cottle. Caleb is a songwriter originally from North Carolina. His most recent album was 2018's Crushed Coins, and as he reveals during this conversation, he's up to some new work. Caleb has a new record coming out this spring. He's been teasing that album's release on his social media, which you should follow because he is an excellent follow on Twitter. Um, And that's where we originally connected. After exchanging a couple of messages on the Twitter box, we made plans to catch up the weekend of the Folk Yeah Festival here in Orlando last November. The song you're hearing in this episode is NYC in the Rain from Crushed Coins. On the other side of town Might as well be Waking up to the smell of smoke Hey y'all, before we get to the conversation with Caleb, I want to make you an offer. I want to give you a marinade t-shirt, an exclusive podcast called Jason's Journey, and access to a community of marinade friends and family, and I'm going to give it to you for 10 bucks. Now, this deal is going to run until February 9th. The goal of this is to expand the reach of the marinade. So let me let me explain. The show is completely DIY, right? I book all the guests. I do all the research. I conduct all the interviews, edit the show, operate the social media, on and on and on. There's a lot that goes into producing a podcast. And I love this work. And I'm not complaining at all about all of that stuff. If I start complaining, I'll quit doing it, which I don't see happening anytime soon. It's just that I want to do more of it, right? Like I, I love what I'm doing here and I think we're doing a good thing and I want to expand that. Well, in our, our Patreon community, we're really fortunate to have a close knit group of people over on Patreon. Patreon is a, a website where you can contribute to your favorite creators. Just a few bucks a month goes a long way for us. We share ideas over on that page. Um, I, uh, share the moments that have that have shaped my creative life. We get discussions going about the episodes. It's just a deeper way to connect with the marinade with Jason Earl. The way the show works now is I basically have to wait for someone to come through Orlando or nearby in order to book a conversation with them. We've done a few remotes. Either I'm on vacation or I've made a couple of trips to to meet up with people. And some of those experiences have been the coolest because you're in a different environment and there are other factors at play and I'm not necessarily on my home turf. Um, so there's something to be said for both. I want to do more of that. Um, now, thankfully, most folks I want to talk with come through Orlando. Um, but there are things like the Mile Zero Fest in Key West that I would absolutely love to attend. And I know our our fans would like to hear from many of the artists there. And if we could just expand a little bit. So if we can add 10 more $10 patrons, those kind of festivals would be a reality for me. I could fly in for the weekend, cover the shows, uh, take photos, get a chance to interview a bunch of different artists, and then fly back and make it to my day job on Monday. So if you can swing it, 
we would be so grateful for you to join our Patreon family. And like I said, I'm going to give you a little bit of an incentive to do it. Normally our shirts, which are high quality shirts, it's not like I'm giving you some kind of uh, crusty old heavy shirt. This is the, the sort of material that you're going to want to wear. It's a good looking shirt. The logo is designed by my partner, Chris. The shirts are made by our neighbors at Pink Robot Shirts, my, abs- my next door neighbor, right? <laughs> Directly next door. Um, who does an excellent job with all of their shirts and and with the ones that they produce for us? Um, so it's a it's a it's a little piece of the marinade. It's a the the spirit of the marinade truly coming to life in these shirts. And usually they're twenty five bucks, but if you join our Patreon community at the ten dollar level between now and February 9th, I'll send you a shirt for ten bucks. All right, y'all. That's enough of me pitching things. I am so honored. To present my conversation with Caleb Cottle. Yeah, yeah. Check, check. About to talk to Caleb. Check one. Hey, two. Hey. Check, check. Check, check. We sound glorious, sir. All right. Dude, thank you so much. This is such an honor. I'm, uh, you know, I've wanted to have you on the show for a while. And man, social media can be the worst and it can also be the best. Yeah. <laughs> um, Twitter connected us. and Yeah. Uh, and then you came... Last night you played an incredible set, man. Well, thank you. Just a wonderful, wonderful set. And um, it was cool to hear it. So there's a lot of things about it. It was a Folk Yeah Festival for folks listening, um, which is just a beautiful, beautiful time. And just an incredible... <laughs> you may hear um, the sweet sounds of our five-month-old puppy, Nonsense. Nonsense is like an unofficial um, guest on the show. It's the mascot. These days, yeah. Official. she's Or she. She is... Uh, yeah, she's she's kind of the unofficial mascot, so she may be making an appearance here in a second. Um, but yeah, it, it was just a, a great job, man. Just a great set, and I loved how I loved a couple of things about it. One of them was I got to hear a lot of it was balanced really well, and I got to hear some new stuff. Um, yeah. So the the record that I've been just absolutely devouring is Crushed Coins, your most recent record. Right. I was on a run the other day, and um. I, it was kind of a longer run and, and I, I got to like near the end where I was kind of like physically drained and, um, and I got to, uh, six, six feet from the flowers. Right. And I just almost had to stop. Yeah. That one's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a thing about your music in general, Caleb, is that a lot of it's heavy, but it, it, you, you craft the song so well that it's like, I'm having to, like I needed to take that medicine. It was really heavy, but the song is crafted so well and it's done so beautifully that it was like, okay, I'm going through a lot here listening to this and 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 going on this journey with this person. But you're able to transport your listener to these like worlds and to these places, which I think is, you know, the goal of of any songwriter, I suppose, but you just you are able to do it in a way that very few are. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um and and I wonder like how you balance because one of the things that I, I, I read is that you said something to the effect of um, that your lyrics are 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 largely biographical, um, and like how do you balance that because that's a lot uh, that's a lot to put yourself out there. Well, honestly, a song like Six Feet from the Flowers, for instance, like I don't even play it live because it's just too much for me at this point. Um, it's just too heavy to sing every night. Yeah. I, I don't want to put myself through that, so. Um, it was a good lesson to learn though, writing something like that. And in, in fact, a lot of tracks on crush coins are dealing with loss. And, uh, what I found was when I went and toured the record the first year, um, I just got really sad at the end of all the <laughs> tours. I was just singing these really deep personal songs every night. Mm. And, um, so I think that kind of informed the way that I would write the record that's going to be coming out next year. Mm-hmm. And um, I tended to, I was still vulnerable, but I tended to try to find more of like the hope in in it all. So um, just because when you're singing it every night, I, you know, I'd rather use that as therapy rather than like, you know, something where I'm like coming away from it, like, man, I'm really sad back at the hotel room. Now. <laughs> like, why is that? Oh, you just sang five songs in a row about death. So, <laughs> you know, I, I was trying to not do that with the new batch. So I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you, trying to do that 
be, man, that's a lot. So trying to do that to avoid having to go through that or trying to do that, uh, like, can you say more about that? Like, do- yeah, basically I, I felt like it was like a weird form of self torture. Mm. Um, not intentionally. Sure. Uh, it, it's just like, I had lost a, a couple friends in the span of like six months who I was close with and both from just like terrible things. And, mm-hmm. um, and then also like, uh, Lauren, my wife, uh, like her grandfather had passed away and like, we just had, it was just felt like the whole year was just like a huge cloud over it. And so I do write biographical and that's what was going on. So that's what I wrote about. But what I didn't consider when doing that was okay at some point I'm gonna have to move on from this and these songs aren't necessarily helping they're more reminding me of how I felt when I was going through it Mm -hmm. rather than helping me move on from it Mm. and so I just didn't want to put myself in that place again and luckily um, I also didn't experience you know any more death surrounding me and so I wrote about different things and, you know, some of that's heavy too, but you know, like with, when death happens, I don't think there's no way to fix that. Yeah. <laughs> so y- you're just like experiencing, you're like every, every night I was singing is like, I'm just being reminded that I don't get to talk to those people anymore. So that was hard and I didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> Damn, dude. So what do you do, uh, you know, steering away from the creative part for a second and getting to the personal part? Like what, if the songs weren't helping, the songs were in some ways maybe making it more difficult because you had to continually face it. So right. what, what do you do personally to move on? Well, that's the thing. I think initially they really did help because it's like I needed to uh, explore what I was going through. But at some point it felt like, I was just kind of like running circles in a maze with Mm. it and it never felt like I was getting to the end of the maze. And so I kind of just needed to try and leave it behind so I could get past it. Yeah. (laughs) What does, does the process for you differ from when you're talking about these heavy, heavy things and going through this heavy thing, these heavy things versus the process of writing the songs for the the new record that maybe isn't quite as heavy. Yeah. You know, life, <laughs> life is funny. So, you know, death, death is like the, the heaviest of all heavy things. Right. Sure. Uh, so, but then there's also other things that, you know, corruption um, on every level, <laughs> yeah and and trying to face that and then uh you know like trying to face issues with like um being proud of something being too proud of something trying to you know evaluate your worth that kind of thing i think those are really heavy too and i try to just apply the same seriousness with writing that i apply to everything so um hmm. yeah i don't know i don't yeah are you a serious person? Probably. Really? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I think I just I'm just like inherently kind of like have a darkness. Yeah. And um I, I don't know. I don't think that's such a bad thing. Yeah. I, I'm kind of drawn to people like that anyway. So um you know, it, it it can make for some uh some moments where you know, you wish you could be a little bit more lighthearted, but <sighs> It's hard. I, yeah. I feel like, you know, if you're really tapped into what's going on around you and like you, for, for me, it's always about listening. Like the more I can um, just like listen to people and like what they're going through and their the problems that they're dealing with day to day and like, you know, try to connect that with what I'm doing. And um, yeah, life's heavy. I don't know, man. Maybe I yeah. am too serious. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I bring that up because I, I, I'm accused of that, you yeah. know, I, and, I, and I think it's fair, you yeah. know, like I'm accused of being too serious and I think it's fair and it's something that I don't know that I fucking work on, man. You know, <laughs> like I, I, I'm kind of with you. Like I think th- because for me, it all ties back to death. I mean, what you just brought up, yeah. like, how, how heavy death is like that 
that's what it all ties back to for me. And I think it's why I take things so seriously. Um, now, sometimes that manifests itself in negative ways. And I think that's the yeah. thing to work on, right? Is that like... Right. Because sometimes you can really kill the party. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And and what... Like, why not have more joy, you know? Right. And so, yeah. And, you know, with with music's really special because there's ways to get around being serious, but also, you know, still making people tap their toes. Mm. So, you know, I think... I think Motown and Stax are a good example of that, where you're taking these really, really heavy themes about, you know, racial inequality and injustice, and then you're putting them to uh, major chords, and you've got, like, the funkiest groove. And it kind of, like, it offsets it a little bit. Mm. No one's leaving those shows. No one's leaving a Motown show bummed out. (laughs) But they have just experienced, whether they know it or not, some very heavy themes are being sang about. Yeah. And um, I tried to do that with the new record. I wanted to make it to where, yes, I have my seriousness within the lyrics and the themes of the songs, but also like I wanted the music to be a little bit more move. I wanted it to move more yeah. and I wanted it to um, just groove. Like I wanted it to uh, keep the minds thinking and keep the toes tapping. You know, like right. that, that was the whole, I wanted to walk that line. I think it's pretty special when people can do that. Well, can we, can we get a little granular on that? Um, you, you t- tweeted the other day, you said, quit waiting around to be inspired. It don't work like that. Um, is that like, so what does that look like in practice for you uh, on a daily basis? Like, are you sitting down to do the work? Um, are you, uh, are you writing, you know, in, in big moments, it, it seems like, especially since so much of your your music is biographical, like, are you just documenting everything somewhere? Um, yeah, I think so. Well, I think it's important to just like, as a writer, just to constantly listen. I, I know it's, it seems maybe a little counterintuitive, but I just think that that's how you get the most out of life if, if you're hyper aware of what's happening. And, um, but yeah, I think I I try to write every day, you know, and sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't, but, but like, I definitely sit down with my guitar every day to, to write. Even on the road? Um, yeah. Like in the hotel room this morning I was, I pulled out the guitar and I was working. So dope. Yeah. I would imagine harder on the road. It's gotta be so much harder. It is because there's like, um, at home, a lot of times I'll just set aside, the day yeah and i can just work yeah and then you know if it doesn't happen it doesn't happen but there's no deadline but on the road it's always like all right well you can write for 45 minutes and it's just like 45 minutes like i don't know if i can do anything in 45 minutes so it's a little harder because you're like breaking up a song in like multiple 30 to 45 minute sessions of just getting yeah but it's like you're constantly having to go somewhere so well, but I don't the, get as much writing done. And, and is it difficult for you when that happens? Like the, uh, are you are you good at the multiple sessions and then coming back to it and piecing it together, or does it need to to be like a chunk of time for you? Sometimes it works out better to do multiple sessions because you can kind of just take your time with it and stretch your legs on it and see what works and what doesn't and revise. But Sometimes I will sit down and write a song top to bottom. Six Feet From the Flowers wrote it top to bottom in 30 minutes, maybe. Wow. But that it doesn't always happen that way. And and I, I think, you know, I've heard some people say, you know, those are the best songs is when you can sit down and write. But I don't know that I agree with that. Mm. I, I think each song is so individualistic, at least the way I approach it. I'm just, you know, I, I don't look at, you know, I don't think anything's. I don't. I don't care how you get there. If a good song's a good song, you know. Mm, so, so mm-hmm. that's kind of where I'm at with it. I used to think that I needed to sit down and write all at once, and so I could maintain that thought. But what I've been doing lately is when I do get stumped and I have to do all these sessions. So, like maybe halfway through the song, I'll start really thinking about like if I can boil this down to one word, like what what word represents this song and so 
I kind of go from there. How often does, how often do you hit those walls? Every day. Every day. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I would think every day. And that comes from just wanting to top yourself. Uh, And it's like, you're only, you know, you're only yourself. So (laughs) you just, you know, for me, it's like just trying to be better. And, and so with that comes a lot of, you know, you let yourself down a lot when you're constantly trying to outdo yourself. Is it, is it just you that you're trying to top or, I mean, you, you know, last night you mentioned the last time you're in Orlando, I, I want to say you said you were with like John Moreland and Aaron Lee Tash and great, great songwriters and, uh, and you're in the orbit of great songwriters all the time. Um, last night we saw some incredible writers. Mm-hmm. Um, are you ever feeling like, uh, competitive in that way like if you hear somebody do say something just incredible do you find yourself wanting to, to, to keep up with that or is it just you in competition with yourself competition with myself I mean you know certainly inspired by others but the goal for me at the end of the day is just to top myself and it always has been since I started writing so um, yeah I don't know that I would ever hear a song and feel competitive with it i Mm. definitely have said things like man i wish i wrote that one sure um but that's the compliment of the highest degree i think you know to hear some work and feel like man you know they really stumbled onto something you know and clearly i mean aaron and john are two of the best songwriters i know so right um it's cool to see them both grow and top themselves and it's it's really nice as a as a just now self described serious person, are you um, are you forgiving of yourself or are you particularly hard on yourself? Very very hard yeah. on myself. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> probably an unhealthy amount. But so is is there anything you do to work on that? Hmm. I like hiking a lot. Hmm. Being outdoors is is a big one for me, uh, just to. But I do a lot of riding out outdoors too. I'll just, really? Yeah, I'll just go and, you know, w- 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 usually I'll start with a melody and and then I'll go out in the woods and walk around and try to clear my head and I'll write words to the melody that I've been working on. So it is melody first for you, typically. Yeah. Yeah, or maybe a line or two, but it all kind of comes back to. You know, I don't know, man. Sometimes I think melody is more important than anything. Mm. And I didn't think that for a long time. But but like if I walk away from a show and I'm not humming a song, I feel like something was missed. Mm. Even if the words are great. Well, that that comes through. That comes back to the point that I made at the beginning of this conversation, which was that the way that you structure songs that you take something heavy like six six feet from the flowers and and that i mean that's one example of an Mm -hmm. especially devastating song but that record's pretty fucking heavy yeah the whole thing's heavy and i didn't realize it was that heavy and then i remember being a few months into the tour and just so many people at the merch table were talking about you know loss and what they were going through and it's awesome to be able to connect on that level with people but then I, I started really thinking about it, and I was like, oh, they're connecting with this because of the record's so heavy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and, and so, um, yeah, it's an interesting way that music works with with others and what makes people tick. Well, yeah, I mean, the universality of it and the, the ability to connect, um, even if you haven't gone through that. That's the other thing about talking about melody. I mean, it's true of lyrics, too, I think, but, but melody is is so universal that it doesn't matter what your background is. Um, the example you gave of, of this, the stack stuff and, and the Motown stuff, like the, the fact that you can take these themes that like somebody who grew up the way I grew up can't possibly connect to uh, in any meaningful way from my experience, but that the music I can completely connect to. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is the, that is the the magic of it. <laughs> that is the in, that is the thing that 
as a as a someone who writes about music i is almost impossible for me sometimes to do mm-hmm. uh, because how do you ex- describe these emotions that are so universal that these people are coming to the merch table who may have wildly different experiences from your own but that are connecting to that the the, the universality of of both the melody and the themes you know yeah what when you're that that process part where you're you go out into the you're going hiking um because that's one of the things like i think when i i i backpack quite a bit cool. um and it, it's usually at least one trip a summer where i go out and spend a few days and i think when i first started hiking many years ago i had this like romantic vision of it where i was like i'm gonna go and get in tune with nature and i'm gonna like write the great american novel and all these wonderful things are gonna happen and then I found myself just being like, all right, where am I going to sleep? Where am I going to poop? What am I going to eat? <laughs> you know, it's right. like one foot in front of the other. Right. Um, so are you going on day hikes and do you, do you have spots you go? Like, what does that look like that you're able to write? Yeah. You know, a lot of, a lot of day hikes, there's a park by our house that has a nice greenway by the river. And, and so I do that one a lot. And when, when I was still in North Carolina, we, there's a place called hanging rock and I've been going there since I was a kid. So um, that one's really special to me. But then a lot of the stuff we do on tour is national parks, uh, which um, me and me and Lauren both really love. And, you know, we've probably in the last three years been to, I don't know, 35 national parks. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah. It, I feel really fortunate to be able to see see some of that stuff. You know, just beauty of untouched land. I just, you know, you only... You, that only happens once. So right. once once it's gone, it's gone. And, you know, so uh, it's really special, and I I feel really passionate about you know protecting that. When it's so important now more than ever. I mean, just I mean, especially with the the current administration's like almost assault on national parks. It feels like. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think anyone who's put money above everything else is gonna not really see the value and the worth in um, something that doesn't make them money. Right. Speaking of which, um, what was the moment that you said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump off and and do music full time. Uh, it'll be seven years ago, um, Mm -hmm. in January. Wow. Yeah. What did that decision look like for folks? I mean, there's a lot of folks that listen to the show who are wrestling with that. Your, your humble host included. Um, what, like, how did you get to that place? I was uh, working at a pizza joint in North Carolina, and I was uh, playing music on the weekends, pretty much. Uh-huh. And um, I started playing music so much. I started playing so many shows that I was just having to ask off for work a lot. And then it got to a certain point where I just felt like I just like couldn't. Uh, deliver ranch dressing to people anymore Mm. (laughs) it was just like i can't do this anymore yeah i've got more to offer uh than that and i think everyone does right not to say that waiting tables is a anything wrong with it there's nothing wrong with it but if there's something you're more passionate about then i think you can just run run for that and uh my overhead was really low so i'm not even gonna pretend like it wasn't Uh, (laughs) so that was really low and uh, you know and I sold everything I own, literally. Wow. Yeah. That's a huge leap, man. I it, mean, it was. It didn't feel like it at the time. It felt so easy and normal. And I don't know. I, 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 I thought to myself, I was like, I can't imagine still working at this pizza joint in a decade. I, You know, I, I just couldn't imagine it. Yeah. And so um, I booked myself like a really long tour. And I put in my notice at the place I was working. And, um, yeah, I sold everything except for my record collection. Uh, there's some steer horns that my brother gave me. And then my guitars. And, uh, you know, whatever clothes I had. But, yeah, everything else I sold. Were you married then? No. No. Do you no. think that would have changed things at all? Well, yeah, I think so. Um, and, and I think it was also really important that me and Lauren started dating after I had already been playing music full time and touring full time. Right. I don't think that I could have convinced anyone that 
this was going to be the new normal and it was going to be a good idea to be gone 150 days or whatever it is a year. And, uh, it was even more early on because I wasn't making any money at any of the shows. So I had to play 200 shows a year, you know, or whatever it was. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a, we're keeping it around 150 right now because anything more than that just kind of, I don't know. It starts getting, I mean, it's already feels so blurry, Mm. but if I ramp it up, which we might be doing more than that next year, but we'll see. With the record coming out, yeah, those are always the the big years, you know, where you're just gone constantly. But it's nice because Lauren's with me, so that's that's helpful. Yeah, it's a game changer, mm-hmm. right? Like you, I mean, that's the thing about, I, and I think so often, I like I wrestle with this a lot because I ask myself, like, I feel like I'm good enough at my creative pursuits. I've got a lot of room for growth and I, you know, for sure. Um, we all do. Um, but I feel like I'm good enough that if I had just, if I just made the leap, it would be a struggle for a while. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like I could do, I could get there, you know? Yeah. Like it's still a struggle for me though. Right. I'm seven years in and it's like, it's like you never, as soon as you lose the hustle, it, you know, it all goes away. So I don't know. You <laughs> it, just got to keep hustling. It's tough, man, because it's like, I mean, I got a great health plan provided by my employer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've got retirement benefits, sure, yeah. <laughs> paid time off. Yeah. You know, I just yeah, had I mean, a week you, off. <laughs> yeah, I did have to definitely, I had to sacrifice pretty much everything, really. But it it it, it felt easy. Yeah. <laughs> it felt worth worth it, so... Yeah, it's cool. That's beautiful, man. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure glad you did it. Um, one of the one of the things we always kind of uh, finish up on is um, talking about the art that's inspiring you at the moment. Maybe something you've been reading, something you've been watching, mm-hmm. some, something you've been listening to, maybe all of the above. Like, what's got you fired up right now? Hmm, let me think here. I've been on, like, as far as music goes, I've been on a really big – Tom T. Hall and Roger oh. Miller kick. Oh wow! And um, Tom T. Hall is my father's favorite artist, and I, like we used to listen to that greatest hits. I've got it on vinyl uh, in the in the yeah. other room. It's weird. I, I like you know I've liked both of them for a really long time, but I for whatever reason I've just really been gravitating towards them lately. Yeah, um, they're interesting. And um, I'm trying to think what else is happening, man. I've just been on the road so long for this stretch that I'm like really out of the loop um, <laughs> about what else going on. I really love the new his golden messenger record. I've been spending mm. time with that. And my favorite record this year is the tallest man on earth uh, thing he put out this year. I've, I spent a lot of time with that. You're the second person in two days to tell me that. Oh really? Patrick Hagerman. Did you meet Patrick or do you know him? I don't think so. He played a, a few sets. Yeah. Yesterday and the day before he's wonderful, wonderful songwriter and great guitar player. But he, yeah, yeah, that's what he said. Um, I'm trying to think of what else is really inspiring me lately. I know there's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Are you reading anything? Uh, I wish that I could tell you that I was reading a book right now. My next, the next book I want to read is where the crawdads sing. Um, that keeps coming up too. Yeah. I keep seeing it everywhere. I really want to get into it. And somebody told me, uh, there's a book called ramp nation that I would really like. So mm. I want to check that out. Uh, I'm planning on getting some reading done, uh, in the winter my downtime and that's <laughs> you don't read on the road like in the hotel after a show or something no usually i just uh you know watch the office or something uh-huh. you know like i feel like after the show is like the time where i i just exercise all of my terrible habits like eating pizza and watching the office um, eating pizza and watching the office sounds like a wonderful day to spend my day. What way to spend my day today? It's a really <laughs> I have so nice much way to, do. To, to unwind. Yeah, I have so much to do, and I'd much rather do that. You may have just ruined my day, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm really excited for as far as TV goes. I'm really excited for the new marvelous Miss Maisel season mm-hmm. to come out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like the writing and the acting on that show a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, writing on shows is something um, that has become. I'm a big uh, fan of Brian Koppelman, um, mm-hmm. you know, and I, Billions. I love the show Billions. Yeah, and uh, Craig Mazin, you know, who wrote Chernobyl, and um, I've uh, I've recently gotten into 
paying attention to television writing. It's gotten really good. It's so good. It's gotten really good. There's so many outlets for it now. So it's like, you know, you're no longer just being forced. You have a lot of choices. Right. And so with a lot of choices comes some stuff that maybe have been, you know, non-existent a few years back. And I think there's like, there's lessons to be learned in other writing disciplines. I think there's lessons to be learned in songwriting. There's lessons to be learned in any sort of long form writing from what, what those folks are doing now. Yeah. Uh, Another thing that I really find myself reading constantly is the new yorker Mm. um i'm just a big fan of like long form essays uh that's probably my favorite thing to read especially when i'm on the road because it's something i usually read that in the mornings so i'll wake up and and make a coffee and read some articles in new yorker so that like first thing yeah yeah, I like to understand what's happening, and I, I like it when people, you know, I don't really like short <laughs> essays. Right, right. It just feels so half-baked to me, and so um, I, I like diving in, going deep and, and stuff. And everything's getting shorter, man. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about, like, I'm a um, subscriber to The Atlantic. Yeah. print subscriber to The Atlantic, and uh, I remember years ago there was an article in here about the length of the length of articles and, and, um, how, and it was almost, it was critical. The article was of how long, and again, this was many years ago, how long, um, how, how long news articles, uh, are and how with people's shrinking attention spans, how so much really important information is slipping through the cracks because people won't stop and spend the time to read it. Um, but that is definitely not me. <laughs> you know, I would yeah. much rather spend some time with an article and, and, and really get deep, you know? Right. Yeah, I think people really enjoy just surface small talk, and so sh- short articles really play into that. You, you know, the other thing I wonder about, because I've uh, asked myself this about, about my habits, is like how – how often people are just looking to consume and constantly consume and how much it it's almost like they feel as if they're not accomplishing something if they are spending too much time on one article um or like I, i've catch my I, i'll catch myself sometimes doing this with books where i'm like um i should live in this book for a while right there's a lot here and i should reread pages and i should spend some time with it and there's no race like I, i'm not Nobody's going to be impressed if I read 10 books this month, you know, like, <laughs> right. nobody gives a shit <laughs> and right. I shouldn't eat yourself included. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I just read the damn book. And if it takes me six months to read it, then it takes me six months to read it, you know? Right. But I do wonder how much of that is just like consumption culture and just the need to like, probably so, you know? It. Yeah. I, I think that's probably right. Um, Caleb, man, this has been such an honor. Thank you so much uh, for everything. Thank you for your set last night. It was beautiful. I had so much fun at that festival, and um, I'm so grateful that you made the trip down here. I know it's not easy to, to get down here to Orlando for uh, for a 40 minute set or whatever it was you played last hey, night. Man, it's all you know. It's all part of it. You, you packed a lot in though in those 40 or 45 minutes, and and I'm really really thankful for that. Um, do you have a release date for the record yet, or? sense of when the new record's coming out uh yeah in the spring i I don't know the exact date um i think in april or something i'm not sure when this comes out but um yeah it'll be before april (laughs) it'll be yeah we've got we've been really fortunate man i've got um i've got two feature episodes in the can and then this will be the the third so really probably like a month and a half now i'm kind of caught up i've been um, it's, and that's the thing I was talking about earlier when you give me time, like I had a week off and so I was able to just do, I mean, I, right. I'll get up in the morning and do the work if I, if I have the time to do it. Um, but it's just a matter of having that time and that creative capital, you know, yeah. it's like, what am I going to work on today is the other thing sometimes that I struggle with because, um, you know, I've been writing a novel. Well, if I spend two hours on the novel, it's, I don't have a whole lot left for, you know, editing the podcast. Right. Um, I need to take that break and watch the office and eat the pizza. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I do think that, you know, as a creative person, I, there's only so much I could each day that I can give to it. Yeah. Or else, you know, you'll just walk around like a zombie afterwards because you've completely 
wrecked your brain trying right. to trying to do whatever you're trying to do right and at some point it's diminishing returns you know just doing it to do it isn't all that helpful all the time but i do think that like and again coming back to that point that you made about you know waiting around to be inspired like you do have to i've learned that for me at least i should say i have to do the work and even if i'm not feeling it i got to do the work um because i got to get through the tough stuff before i can get to the good bits you know I think another part of that, you know, to add to the inspiration bit, it's kind of like, for me, if I'm uninspired, it means I'm depressed. Uh, and, and so, like, trying to chase inspiration is a way of basically running from depression. So that that's a whole other bit to it that I think a lot of people don't consider, which is like, you know, if I'm not learning anything new and I'm not, you know, trying to, you know, if I'm not trying to taste new foods and see new places and you know challenge my thoughts you know i'll usually get sad mm. so like my my way to co combat sadness is is to um try to experience things i've never experienced and that does it for you that gets you out of the depression yeah that's fucking beautiful man i mean that's the only thing i, I think you know so not not, that's the thing that works. <laughs> that's the thing that works. Yeah, for me. I mean, I think a lot of people would, it would work for a lot of people if they um, if they just tried it. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I know that, like, the formula for me is pretty clear, too. Like, if I'm, if I'm um, exercising, I'm uh, creating, and I'm, and I'm reading every day, I know I'm okay, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. But I, I still, a lot of that, uh, I think, for me at least, a lot of that is just me trying to distract myself sometimes from shit that I probably should be dealing with. I've been really fortunate. Again, part of the reason why I won't take the leap into a full-time creative life is that I do have good insurance and I do have a great therapist. And yeah. when I, you know, and I, and I work, I do the work every day on, on my anxiety so that, you know, but it's like, it's the package, right? So it is right. experiencing new things. It is the reading. It is the, the writing. It is the exercising. Plus, I also have this other piece that I need, you know, I've learned that I need, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and if I didn't have access to that, um, uh, my life would be a lot more difficult, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So dude, thank you so much. Yeah. Safe travels. Sure. Thank you. I really appreciate it, man. I'll, uh, I'll let you know when this comes out and I'll send it, send you a copy. All right. What All right, can I do? If it's true, Caleb Cottle, y'all. Thank you so much, Caleb. Thank you all for listening. Head on over to calebcottle.com for all things Caleb. Can't wait for that new record. Uh, he's, again, a great follow on Twitter as well. He's always got something clever to say, so follow him over there. You can find all things Marinade at marinadepodcast.com. Give us a follow on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We're especially active on Twitter and Instagram. And you can follow updates on the show and see pictures of our adorable puppy, Nonsense, who you heard during this episode making her presence very well known, as she should. Um, I won't say anything more about the Patreon, but but seriously, y'all, these are super comfy shirts. And you can get one for 10 bucks. Come on. All right, y'all, it's time for what I'm getting down on. This, this is the segment of the show where I talk about the art that is inspiring me at the moment. I put a question on Instagram, on my Instagram story, 
last weekend asking folks what they're listening to, uh, and I got some great suggestions. Duran Jones and the Indications. Uh, my friend Susie recommended them. Just great soul music. Um, really digging what they're putting down. And uh, I also have been heavily into Will Hogue recently. Um, he put out a record called My American Dream in 2018, and it is just a dynamic, fiery piece of work. I've just been devouring that one. Um, I listened to it on, I've been training for a marathon and I had a pretty long run uh, last weekend and I put on that record and just made me, I was hauling ass. I felt like it just, every word is a kick in the pants. It's, it's just go check it out if you haven't already. And if you have revisit it also the band fruition, who we've been a fan of for a long time has a new record that dropped last week It's called Broken at the Break of Day. Uh, Look for more about that album um, in my conversation with Fruition's J. Cobb Anderson, which will drop as a bonus episode next week. Also, huge thanks to our episode 47 guest, Kelsey Walden. How about Kelsey, y'all? What an incredible songwriter and what a cool person to talk to. She turned me on to the record Southern Ambrosia by Christina Murray. So good. Damn, y'all. I mean, I've been excited about a lot of music of late. Um, There's just so much good stuff out in the world. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult to distill it all down. But I've been trying to live in records a little bit more um, instead of just continually consuming, kind of like we talked about, Caleb and I talked about with books and articles, instead of trying to consume as much as possible, really spending time with the art that I'm consuming. Um, Speaking of which, on the TV end of things, I just got into Letterkenny on Hulu. Like I'm, I'm laughing just thinking about it. It was so much fun. It's such a hilarious show. Um, it's about these self-described hicks in rural Canada. It's really smartly written. It's so much fun. There's like eight seasons or something crazy. I'm working my way through them now. Um, check it out though. It's it's very bingeable. The, the episodes are pretty short, and it's just so clever and super fun. The writing is just incredible. I mean, I could keep going, but I feel like. I'm in that space where, um, you know, there's, there's just so much art that I'm getting fired up about right now. Um, but if I keep going, then I won't be able to get to the other things that I need to do today. Got to work on my novel, got a long run going this afternoon. So until next time, go out and create something. Cheers y'all.